An important consequence of the Earth's rotation around its axis is the creation of an apparent force which, among other things, impacts ocean and wind dynamics. Called the Coriolis force, it is named after the French mathematician Gustave Coriolis, whose name is engraved on the Grenelle side of the Eiffel Tower. To find out more about Coriolis and his scientific contributions, I am now joined by Professor Lor saint -Rimo. Thank you very much for your time. Who was Coriolis? So Coriolis was a French uh, engineer and scientist from the beginning of the 19th century. Actually, he was born during the French Revolution. And he studied in the Ecole Polytechnique, as many of the scientists, uh, of the French scientists of this uh, uh, period. And so, first of all, in, at the beginning of his career, he was uh, an engineer of uh, Ponts et Chaussées, so meaning that he was uh, part of this uh, state corporation uh, studying bridges and roads. Okay, and then uh, both because of health reasons and also because uh, he was maybe more interested in science and in technology, he decided to uh, move to the academia. And so he was professor uh, in the Ecole Centrale and in the Ecole des Ponts et Chaussées and then in the Ecole Polytechnique. And he made a lot of contributions to science and actually he was a member of this uh, French Academy of Sciences. He has many contributions both on the physical uh, on physical topics and also on mathematical topics. So maybe I can quote four of them. So of course there is this, this contribution about, uh, but I guess we will discuss it uh, later on, uh, about uh, the Coriolis force. But um, he also contributes about uh, uh, billiards and uh, the, the, the trajectories of, uh, of uh, billiard balls with uh, collisions between themselves and then on the boundary of the billiard. And he also uh, worked on this, um, uh, on some geometric uh, curves, so that uh, he studied, and that still, uh, uh, so the log cosine uh, uh, curve. And uh, also, but say, um, it, it was maybe the first one to formalize uh, really uh, this, this principle of uh, thermodynamics around uh, kinetic energy and uh, mechanical work. So it's really at the interface between mathematics and physics, and this I like very much because, because uh, I feel liberated in the same uh, spirit. <laughs> right. What is the Coriolis force and how did he discover it? So actually the Coriolis force is not a force. <laughs> I think it's important. So uh, essentially what, what happens is that, uh, uh, so say the Classical mechanics is governed by this principle, uh, going back to Newton, which tells you that the acceleration of a mechanical system is proportional to the sum of the forces which are applied to the system. But this, this uh, principle is correct only if you are in a Galilean frame. But so if you are on a, on a rotating frame, then this principle is not true. Okay? But you can still write the same principle provided that you add another force. And this force is not really a force in the sense that uh, you don't really uh, apply uh, a constraint to the system. But this is just another way to, to write uh, a change of coordinates. So the Coriolis force is really the results of a computation that, uh, uh, say, allows to go from this principle in a, in a Galilean, so non-rotating frame, and write the same in a rotating frame. So th this is really some kind of uh, uh, mathematical force, just, just because of this change of variable. What is important in the work by Coriolis is really the fact that he was able to do a computation. So to really formalize this, this force, and maybe something which is important is that this force is both perpendicular to the axis of rotation and perpendicular to the velocity. And, and so he was able to really uh, give a, a formulation of, of this, this principle, which is a mathematical formulation. But say even before the work of Coriolis, it was known already that, that uh, 
there is kind of consequence of the rotation of the Earth, which is the fact that uh, uh, you will see that uh, somehow the, the fluid, especially in the ocean that you can observe, is, is deviated uh, uh, essentially to the right in the, in the North Hemisphere and to the left in the, in the Southern uh, Hemisphere. How did he discover it? Actually, it was not studying the, the, the motion of the atmosphere or to, of the sea, but uh, he was interested in this, um, in this um, uh, um, water wheel, you know, and, and in, the, in writing some mathematical models for this water wheel. So he was not really interested in this. Uh, um, and you see that it's a very different scale because the size, of course, of the water wheel is, is smaller, but uh, also the, the, the speed of rotation is much bigger. So if you would like to see the Coriolis force, you need to have a certain ratio between this, this different uh, length and, and, and time. And so I think it's important to say that, uh, for instance, there are many people saying that, okay, uh, in your, uh, in your uh, bathroom, you will see the water uh, moving like this or like that because you are in the North Hemisphere. But all of this is just, um, <laughs> uh, it's completely fake, <laughs> except if you have a big, 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 big bathroom. <laughs> what is the significance and the applications of the Coriolis force? What is really important is that now we have this, this mathematical formulation of this, uh, of this uh, the, the effect of rotation. And it's very important, especially for all these uh, uh, ocean models and atmosphere models. So, um, and also just to understand the, the, uh, the dynamics, say, at uh, leading order of the ocean. So um, maybe I can, I, can, I can just tell you this, this story because I think it's really important. So if you look at the, the ocean, of course, it's a 3D, uh, a 3D fluid. But um, actually, because of this uh, strong rotation, the, the, the fluid will behave like a fluid in the uh, horizontal dimensions, but like a, a solid in the, the vertical dimension. So it's, it's like you have a, a lot of, of uh, uh, columns of fluids that can just move uh, with respect to, to each other, but they cannot really exchange water between them. So this is very important because, for instance, if you have a, a, a mountain, uh, you see that these columns, they, they cannot change their, their, uh, their height. Okay? And so you see that if you have a, a big columns and a mountain, then the big columns cannot go over the mountains. And so it, it will have to just go around the mountains. And this is something that you can, you can also reproduce in, in lab experiments. So you see that if you have a topography, then because of these constraints of the Coriolis force, it will uh, really um, uh, change the motion because, because say you have really this 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 uh, solid behavior in the vertical uh, in the vertical uh, dimension. And in Grenoble, you have a, a big lab experiments with a Coriolis platform named after Coriolis, which is um, I don't know exactly maybe twenty or thirty meters of diameter, and that turn. Uh, uh, all the time, and then you, you can see this this kind of. Uh, of course, they, they study a lot of different things because, say, the rotation is also responsible for uh, for uh, uh, propagation of uh, very specific waves that are called uh, Poincaré and Rossby waves. It's also responsible for some very uh, interesting effects uh, along the boundary, so uh, along the coasts. So there are many effects, but maybe this one where you see that uh, the columns of fluids are like solids are really interesting because you can just um, put some, some colors in the water and then you really see uh, just the water uh, making a detour just to avoid the mountains. I think it's really impressive.